Hello and welcome to this NET English Poetry Talk Through, focusing in this video on War Photographer by Caroline Duffy. As ever, we're going to start with a quick read through of the poem. So, War Photographer. In his dark room, he is finally alone, with spools of suffering set out in ordered rows. The only light is red and softly glows, as though this were a church and he a priest preparing to intone a mass. Belfast, Beirut, Phnom Penh, all flesh is grass. He has a job to do. Solutions slop in trays beneath his hands, which didn't tremble then, though seem to now. Rural England, home again, to ordinary pain which simple weather can dispel to fields which don't explode beneath the feet of running children in a nightmare heat. Something's happening. A stranger's features faintly start to twist before his eyes, a half-formed ghost. He remembers the cries of this man's wife, how he sought approval without words to do what someone must, and how the blood stained into foreign dust. A hundred agonies in black and white, from which his editor will pick out five or six for Sunday supplement. The reader's eyeballs prick with tears between the bath and pre-lunch beers. From the aeroplane he stares impassively at where he earns his living, and they do not care. Let's start by talking a bit about Carolyn Duffy. So Carolyn Duffy, who was born in 1955, is a Scottish poet. She's a playwright, a lecturer, editor, she's a critic, um, and she served as Poet Laureate from 2009 to 2019. Now, Duffy's ambition to be a writer was formed during her childhood, and she's spoken quite openly through, you know, over the years about the influence of um, people like Ted Hughes on her style. While she's also been quite critical about what she sees as the overcomplicated linguistic style of poets like, uh, say, Seamus Heaney. Now, despite being raised within a devout Roman Catholic family, Duffy is an atheist. She accepts religion, however, as quite an influence on her poetry, and she does make parallels between poetry and prayer. Although her work ranges widely, there are some recurrent themes in her writing. So those things include uh, the influences and the processes that shape people, uh, gender, particularly in relation to power dynamics, um, violence and oppression, uh, memory, language. Duffy often ventriloquizes in her work, depicting or adopting voices, especially of um, outside figures and exploring through those, through those voices, their emotional, their psychological and their social lives. Duffy published War Photographer uh, in 1985, and it was based on the experiences of her friend Don McCullen, predominantly. Now, Don McCullen is one of Britain's most famous photographers, and he spent a lot of his career taking pictures during wars in locations such as Northern Ireland, Cambodia, um, Iran, Uganda, Afghanistan. Now, McCullen's style of photography combines a compassion for his subjects with a focus on aspects of light and composition. And McCullen often places himself in danger to take his photographs and to document the experiences of his subjects. Now, the title of the poem, War Photographer, seems straightforward. But it's worth noting the way in which the, at least in the poem, anonymous photographer is solely defined by his role. He's not an individual just a war photographer. The poem, however, unpacks the emotional and psychological impact of his job, along with a sense of the futility he feels regarding the impact of his actions. There's the photographer, defined by his career, and then there's the reality of the person as well. It's the same process the photographer follows in the poem, trying to shift the perspective of the public from war as something distant and anonymous to the individual, to the, the personal reality of the subjects of his photographs. Now, Duffy has spoken in the past regarding her choice of form. The four stanzas are each six lines long, and those are called sestets or sextets, and lines throughout the poem are around the ten-syllable mark, but with a bit of variability. There are occasional rhymes or partial rhymes within the stanzas, so rose and glows or six and prick, and every stanza finishes with a rhyming couplet, so mass and grass, depending on your pronunciation, feet and heat, must and dust, wear and care. What Duffy intended, it seems, is for each individual stanza to act like a photograph, like a single image or a moment, to which we can then bring associations and from which we can draw inferences. The visual organisation 
the largely regular length and rhyming couplet at the each stanza act essentially as a kind of frame. So the poem begins with the photographer in his darkroom and finally alone. Now the darkroom is literally the room in which the photographer develops his photographs from the original spool of film and it's dark in there so that the additional light doesn't blur or damage the photographic film. But it also suggests an escape from the traumatic visual images that occupy his professional life. In this room, he can finally shut out the world. Now, the comment that he's finally alone suggests that this is something he's been waiting for. But he's alone with the spools of suffering that are set out in ordered rows. Now, these spools are literally the films from his camera. They come rolled up in, in cartridges, but with every image on these spools being one of suffering, it, it's almost a sense that this is a reflection of the photographer's emotional state, the coiled up suffering that he's had to internalize, had to retain and restrain into these ordered rows, can also be unraveled and processed now that he's alone. It's noticeable also that there's a juxtaposition between the chaotic suffering in the images and on these, these spools, and that's compared and contrasted with the order and control in his darkroom, where they can be organised and controlled. Though it's possible also that the sense of order could be intended to be some kind of military resonance. From a personal perspective, I think the neatest interpretation is that the darkroom, from a metaphorical angle, reflects the inside of his mind. So the images, the suffering, the attempts to control, the place where he can both process physically and psychologically, and where he can release. Now, the darkroom would literally contain a red light, which is less damaging to um, these very sensitive films. But the glowing red light is also linked to the other key image that Duffy introduces in this stanza, that of the photographer as a priest and the darkroom as a church. Now, it could be interpreted that the red light is about the ongoing pain the photographer suffers. Um, it offers a sense of menace, the inescapability of his memories of, of war. But it's clear that Duffy intends the main purpose of the image to be the religious link. Now, there's a candle, usually red, kept burning in Catholic churches for uh, well, several symbolic reasons. Um, the main reason seems to be to show the apparent ongoing presence of God. In the poem, though, the purpose isn't religious, but secular, with a simile as though this were a church and he a priest, strongly suggesting the care, the reverence, the importance the photographer attaches to his images, almost as if this is a spiritual duty a way of showing respect to those who have died and who are also an ongoing presence for the photographer through his memories and through the photographs. And that fits with the often uh, memorial nature of a mass. Now, the list of places in the final line of the first stanza, Belfast, Beirut, Phnom Penh, refers exclusively to war zones, and that's uh, Northern Ireland, Lebanon and Cambodia. And these are all places that were in real life photographed by Don McCullum. The list suggests a commonality to these places, but also lines them up in ordered rows. And that's perhaps reflecting the ordering of the photographs he's developing, but also the imposition of control over places defined by their chaos and disorder. Now, the reference, all flesh is grass, comes from both the Old Testament, Isaiah, and the New Testament, uh, in terms of Peter. In essence, it suggests that flesh will fade and wither and die, that life is temporary, and also that the lives, compared to the blades of grass, are numerous and can be seen as lacking in individuality or meaning. It's as if these places of conflict have cheapened the view of individual suffering and death. They can just be mown down without consequence and more will spring up. Or that there have been so many that they've become all but anonymous. Or even that there's an organic, a natural cycle to life and death. Now there is in a sense, an irony to Duffy, an atheist, using religious imagery and references to explore secular perspectives and experiences. But equally, perhaps, there's a broader point to the image about where we place our sense of importance and value, that people should matter more than the ephemeral and the abstract. In the second stanza, the photographer has a job to do, it says, and the sense of a shift from the ritualised context of the dark room to the practicalities of developing photographs, that feeling of moving from dwelling on emotions to almost getting on with the job in hand. That said, this could also be a broader comment, 
taking the photographs is both something he has to do and something that has to be done, difficult and, and traumatising though it may be. Now, developing photographs requires the use of various liquids in trays, and those are the solutions that slop in trays. Now, there's a lovely resonance with the idea that the, the developing of the photographs itself represents a solution. Perhaps the revelation and the recording of what's happening is his attempt to solve the problems that he witnesses. It's also worth noticing the details about his hands, which did not tremble then, though seem to now. As a photographer, having steady hands is essential, obviously, and the implication is that when he's in the zone as a photographer, he's able to put aside to, um, to compartmentalise the impact um, that what he sees has on him. But it also requires processing eventually later when he's alone in his darkroom. He's in rural England, with a short sentence almost seeming to label or to categorise his life, just as the other short sentences have so far in the poem. Now, in England, the pain is ordinary, something that can be dispelled by the simple weather and the presence of the fields. And that's juxtaposed with, we assume, the pain in the places he works with, which is extraordinary, which weather cannot impact and where fields explode beneath the feet of running children in a nightmare heat. Now, the reference here seems to be to a famous photograph taken during the Vietnam War of a nine year old girl, terrified and traumatised, running along a road after being badly burned on her back by a napalm attack. Now, the enjambment of the beneath the feet flowing immediately into of running children gives this a sense of momentum and progression, almost like the running children, um, with a description of the nightmare heat, making both the idea of burning by the weather and the explosion, and also the, the lingering aftermath, the mental images that he can't escape, his own nightmare. Now, children are obviously the archetypal victims and the connection of the weather, the nightmare heat, to the unpredictable environment in which the children are found, so fields that explode, shows their helplessness in comparison to the overwhelming forces that surround them, uh, their innocence, their vulnerability and their suffering. Now, the third stanza begins with an immediate shift. Something is happening. Much like the earlier reference to the photographer having a job to do, that short, simple declarative sentence moves from the traumatic memories, the running children, back to the physical reality and the routine of his job. The developing photograph is tracked as it changes, so the stranger's features begin to appear, described as a, as a half-formed ghost. Now, obviously, the image is ghostly. It's not yet <clears throat> clear and defined when I mean, the photograph is only partially developed. But there's also the ambiguity of memory. This was, after all, a stranger. And also the fact that the images he's developing are of the dead. The figure in the image died. So the picture itself becomes the lingering aftermath, the ghost. Now, again, the image becomes a prompt for a memory. He remembers the cries and how he sought approval without words to do what someone must. The permission from the victim's wife is important. He's not exploiting them for his own gain, but seeking consent to do something necessary, something that he believes has to happen. What he did was, evidently, to record the moment with a photograph, rather than seeking to intervene or to help physically, to give the death meaning and a wider purpose, however unpleasant or exploitative it may, help, it may seem or, or, or feel with the sense that this is both morally and personally essential, that, in a sense, he can't not. There's also discussion to be had around the seeking of consent wordlessly. He is, after all, a photographer, someone who works with, understands as, and frames the world through visual images. And the implication could well be that this is something for which there aren't words, that visual images provide a truth that words can't, this is, of course, ironic when it's communicated in a poem, which is arguably the most honed use of words possible. Now, the image of the blood that's stained into foreign dust is evocative, as well as being visually striking. Blood has sacrificial connotations, and that fits with the sense from the photographer of the man's sacrifice being used for a higher purpose. This is, remember, what someone must and it's a throwback to the image from the first stanza of the priest and the mass, 
in the sense of the fundamental connection between Christianity and the central belief in the sacrifice of Jesus and the act of communion, the taking of bread and the wine as body and blood, as something that connects and unifies people. The idea of the blood having stained into the foreign dust also represents the lasting impact, the indelible staining of the blood on the soil. And notice the shift from this man to simply being blood, reduced to his parts, to a visual reference point, but also to the stain on the photographer's awareness. Another traumatic image, another memory of mortality, of dust to dust, to quote the funeral ceremony. There's a suggestion here that the individual death of the man, which is fairly meaningless in terms of public perception, is something that metaphorically stains the country in the sense of both the landscape and the society. However, it also reinforces the photographer's sense of alienation, of being out of place. This is, after all, foreign dust. As a side note, it's noticeable how the image builds and deepens throughout the stanza, almost as if the description is reflecting the increasing clarity of the developing photograph. In the fourth and final stanza, the photographs are bundled, packaged as a hundred agonies in black and white. Notice that the colour has been lost. The blood from the previous stanza becomes simply black and white, suggesting also that the, the nuance and the complexity of the image, of the experience, of the context, has been lost, reduced to the simple binary of black and white. In addition, the individual has been lost. Rather than this man, he's now just one of a hundred agonies, from which the editor will pick out five or six, with the phrasing deliberately casual. After all, it makes little difference to the editor whether there is one more or one fewer photographs. But every photograph represents a life lost and a moment of trauma that the photographer has endured in pursuit of their higher purpose. Now, to add to the sense of futility, the images are chosen for inclusion in Sunday Supplement, an additional section of the paper rather than the main body, and therefore seen as possibly less important as peripheral, with Sunday perhaps another nod to the motif of religion. Now, Duffy is perhaps criticising implicitly the role of religion in all of this, a weakly nod to conscience and awareness that is then ignored in the remainder of people's lives. To add to the sense of utility, we're told that the reader's eyeballs prick with tears, an emotional response, but situated between the bath and pre-lunch beers, a brief irrelevance in their safe, clean, pleasurable, indulgent lives a fleeting and ultimately meaningless moment, especially if we juxtapose the enormity and the lasting impact of the cries of this man's wife and the brief tears of the reader. The poem ends with a final description of the photographer staring impassively from the aeroplane at where he earns his living. Living is an interesting word here. It links both the financial necessity of his work, it's his job, it pays the bills, and also the sense that this is where his life gains its meaning, it's his life, that the death and the suffering he witnesses and the actions he tries to take are how he achieves direction and purpose in his life, however empty and limited the impact, because after all, ultimately, they, the public, do not care. And as to whether this suggests that the public do not care about the subjects he photographs, or that they don't care about the impact it has on him and those like him. That's a question that Duffy leaves, ultimately, open to interpretation. In terms of making links within the AQA anthology, the neatest link is almost certainly to remains. We have the links to military conflict and choice and consequence and memory and the personal impact and also the sense of personal helplessness and futility. However, there's also the idea of the object and the experiences being recorded that could offer an interesting link with something like Milas Duchess or Tissue or Ozymandias. Now, the personal experience and the individual impact could also offer links to bayonet charge or to poppies. And there's also that link to armed conflict and the impact it has in terms of exposure.
Right, thank you very much for listening. I hope that's been useful. Um, as ever, don't forget that there uh, is a whole range of other resources available to you. Um, for example, on the Net YouTube channel, which is www.youtube.com netenglish1, or through the podcasts on Academy websites. Thanks for your time.